Welcome to the Safety in the Home training. My name is Bree Combs and I serve as a Community Connections Coordinator for the Butler County Board of Developmental Disabilities in Hamilton, Ohio. Lots of you have asked for online versions of these safety trainings and so the coronavirus kind of gave me a kick in the pants that I needed to get my first one online. So now that it is online, you can pause the presentation, you can back it up, you can go forward, you can watch it as many times as you want to. I know that for me, hearing things over and over again helps me remember them because it takes my brain and to process the words and I never catch everything the first time. So in this training, we are gonna talk about how to stay safe in our homes, which is really relevant right now as our government is telling us to stay home in order to stay safe and healthy. So what does home look like for you? Home has looked different for me at many different times in my life. Growing up, I lived in a small one-story house with my mom and my brother. On the weekends, though, I would stay with my dad and my stepmom who lived in a two-story house. Then I went to college and lived in an apartment building. So home can look like different things to different people depending on where we live. But what makes a house into a home? A trailer into a home, an apartment building into a home. When you first move into a place, it's just walls and windows and floors. But over time, as you start putting things together in a way, you start eating meals there, you go to sleep there and you wake up there, it starts to feel more like a home. It starts feeling more normal and familiar to you. And maybe that's where you find your family at the end of each day. Maybe that's where you find peace and relaxation. Home is the place where you feel safe and where you belong. So now let's talk about some safety concerns that we can have within our homes. We could have bad weather, we could have flooding, a fire, a break-in. People can ring the doorbell and call on the telephone and we have to figure out how to respond to those. There could be medical emergencies as well as expired food. None of these are things to be afraid of, but they are all things we need to be aware of if we are living out in the community. One way to keep ourselves safe is by avoiding toxic things that will make us sick. Expired food is something we need to be able to identify so that we can avoid eating it. Some foods and packages have dates printed on them so you can tell when you should throw them away. If you don't know what the date is, you can always look at your cell phone if you have one or keep a calendar where you can mark off the days. Other foods turn blue or black or start getting wrinkly when they are going bad. If you see anything like that, you should throw these foods out. When you are keeping leftovers, you should always label them with a the date you seal them and make sure you eat those leftovers or throw them out after three days. Fires are always a big safety concern in homes as there are many ways that we can start fires on accident. Things we use every day can be dangerous, so we need to take time to learn how we can use them safely and prevent fires. For example, toasters. Most of us have toasters in our kitchens, and a simple way to keep a toaster safe is to simply unplug it when you are not using it. Microwaves. There is one major rule when using a microwave. Never ever put metal in there. Never put foil or a fork or even a little tea bag with a staple in there because it could cause an explosion. Make sure you read the instructions on microwavable foods before you put them in there. One time I made a macaroni and cheese uh, cup and I forgot to put water in it. Um, so it started smoking and coming out of the microwave and it was scary, but it was also embarrassing because I had done it on my lunch break at work. So make sure you always read the directions and follow them. Stoves and ovens. These are tricky because they don't make any noise when they are on. When you are done using the stove or the oven, double check that you have turned everything off. Also, make sure you never lay anything on top of the stove, even when you know it's off. Always keep the top of the stove clean. Grills and barbecues. Always grill outdoors and make sure you have a lid in case the flames get too high. Make sure someone who has experience with grills helps you learn how to do this. Cigarettes. 
Never throw a cigarette into the trash can when you are done with it. Let it cool down in an ashtray or in a metal can. Even put the butt in water. Curling irons and straighteners. Always make sure these are unplugged when you are done using them. Clothing dryers. Make sure to clean out the lint fil filter each time before you run it. Always make sure you are home when you run your dryer. Candles. Keep candles above where pets and children can reach. Always stay in the room when you have a candle lit and always blow out the candle before you fall asleep or leave the house. And finally, space heaters. Stay in the room when this is running. These often cause fires when they tip over. Make sure you have a smoke detector on each level of your house. <clears throat> Make sure the batteries are still good. You should test them by pushing the test button once a month or once every other month. You should also change the batteries at least once a year just to be safe. You can also get a strobe light for the outside of your house that will flash if there is a fire. That way your neighbors will be alerted of the emergency and may be able to help. It's important to create a plan in case you ever do have a fire. Make sure that you create this plan with your abilities in mind. For example, if you are unable to use the stairs, it would be safer for you to sleep on the bottom floor. When you are creating your plan, also identify at least two exits out of every room. That way, if the doorway is blocked, you can still get out of a window. Once you do get out, it's a good idea to have a safe meeting place in mind where you will meet your other family members or roommates away from the burning house. It's also a good idea to practice your escape plan at least twice a year with your family, roommates, and caregivers so that it is fresh in your mind. Each night before you fall asleep, make sure you have whatever essentials you need near your bed in case you would have to grab them quickly to escape from a fire. For example, you can keep your glasses, your hearing aids, and your phone on your nightstand next to you while your cane or wheelchair is within reach. Something you can do ahead of time is explain your needs to your local fire department and ask them to keep your information on file. You can also request that the fire department comes out to your home and performs a safety inspection for free. Every season of the year, we experience some sort of extreme weather. How can you be aware of the weather before it happens? Maybe you can watch the weather channel each morning or you check the weather forecast on your phone. Maybe you ask Alexa what the weather will be when you are getting dressed. Really hot temperatures can be a form of severe weather that we need to be careful of. When it's really, really hot outside, we need to do what we can to keep our bodies cooled down. Some different things we can do are taking a cold shower or bath, drinking plenty of water, sitting in front of a fan, or turning our air conditioners on and staying in the area that has been cooled down. If we do not have an air conditioning unit in our homes, we should go to a family member or a friend's house who has air conditioning or a store or a cool restaurant for the hottest hours of the day. It is also a good idea to have your phone with you in severe weather in case you do get overheated and need to call for help. We all know lightning can be dangerous when we are outside, but lightning can still be dangerous even when we are inside our homes. We want to make sure that we stay away from windows, electronics, and water when lightning is striking outside, as lightning can pass through glass, wires, and water. Sometimes our power goes out when it storms bad enough. When this happens, you want to make sure you leave your refrigerator door closed to keep the cold air in there, and you want to use flashlights instead of candles to avoid fires. As soon as you hear that there is going to be any type of severe weather, it is also a good idea to charge your phone just in case of an emergency where you would need to call someone for help. When the weather gets really, really cold, there are several things we can do to make sure we stay warm. If we have a fireplace, that can certainly help us stay warm and heat our house. If you have a furnace, make sure it is on and set to 70 degrees or so. 
It is also important to dress for colder weather even though you are inside. Be sure to put on long pants, long sleeves, thick socks, and wrap blankets around yourself if you want to be extra warm. Space heaters are also a way to heat the room you are in, but not a great way to heat an entire house or apartment. In really, really cold weather, you should also let your faucets drip water to make sure they don't freeze. And as always, be sure to have your phone with you and charged up in case you need to call someone for help if you don't have a way to keep yourself warm at home. If you have no source of heat, you may need to stay with someone else who does have heat in their home on those really cold days and nights. When it rains a lot, there is always a risk of flooding. This could cause water to come into your home. If this happens, be sure to either dry it out yourself with towels and air dryers or call someone for help as water can cause mold to grow in your home and mold can make you very sick. Snowstorms are not always dangerous if you stay in your home, but you want to make sure that you prepare for a snowstorm ahead of time by getting groceries, water, and your essential medications because you could get stuck at home for a few days depending on how much snow falls. And again, make sure you have your phone charged in case you need to call someone for help. In the event of a tornado, which room in this house do you think would be safest? If you chose the basement, then you are correct. The basement is the safest place to be if there is a tornado. If you have time to grab a couple of things before you get down there, try to grab your cell phone in case there is an emergency and you need to call someone for help. In this home, where do you think would be the safest room in the event of a tornado? If you chose the bathroom, you are correct. In a house without a basement, either a bathroom or a closet without windows is the safest place to be if there is a tornado. With any type of emergency, it is important to prepare ahead of time. The best way to prepare is to put together a home emergency kit. So what all is important to have in this kit? First, it's a good idea to have a first aid kit, which includes bandages, band-aids, alcohol wipes, gauze, a thermometer, and antibacterial cream. This can help you take care of a small injury or to help hold things together until you can get to a hospital in the case of a more significant injury. Next, a crank radio, which is a radio that does not need batteries, can help you listen to up-to-date emergency information. As always, you need to make sure your cell phone is charged in the case of an emergency. So putting a cell phone charger in the kit is also a good idea. A flashlight can help if the power goes out. Like the crank radio that doesn't need batteries, you can also get a crank flashlight that does not need batteries. As far as food, water, and medication, it's important to keep at least a three-day supply of each if you would have to stay in your home in the event of an emergency. Talk to your doctor about getting a three-day emergency stash of medicine to put in your emergency kit. Canned goods that don't expire for a long time and jugs of water or water bottles is also necessary. Make sure to pack a can opener so that you can get into those cans. Now let's talk about burglaries. There are several different ways to discourage burglars or break-ins to your home. When you wanna secure your home, whether at night or when you leave, be sure to lock all of your doors and windows. Turn outside lights on and turn a hallway or entry light on so people can see that someone is home inside, or at least think that there's someone home inside. You should also get a deadbolt for your door if you don't already have one. If you are going on vacation, is it a good idea to post about it all over your Facebook page? No, you never want to advertise the fact that you are not going to be home. If you do leave for a trip, you can have police, friends, family, or neighbors you trust Keep an eye on your house when you are gone. Do you have this type of lock on your outside doors? 
If so, this is not enough to keep a burglar out. You must add a deadbolt lock to your outside doors, which make it much harder for someone to break in. When you are home, answering the door safely is very important. So let's walk through some scenarios together to learn when we should and should not open the front door. In each of the next slides, you will see a door in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. When the door is shut, we want to make sure that the door is shut for that particular part of the scene. In some of the slides, you will see the door open, and that is the only time that it is okay to open the door during the scene. So for this first scene, let's get started. Knock, knock. What should we do? Should we look through the peephole or the window first to see who's there? Or should we open the door since someone has knocked? We should always look through the peephole or the door first to see who is out there. In this scenario, when you look outside, you see your staff and they are on time for their shift. Since you knew they were coming and they are on time, you feel comfortable with them being there. So you open the door and let them in the house. Now for our second scenario. Knock, knock. What should we do? Should we look through the peephole or the window first? Or should we open the door since someone has knocked? We should always look through the peephole or the window first to see who is outside. In this scenario, when you look outside, you see a man that you do not know. Because we don't know who that man is, we talk to him through the closed door or window. He says he has the pizza you ordered, but you did not order a pizza. You tell him that you did not order a pizza and that he needs to leave or else you will call the police. He heeds your warning and he does leave. So now you have a choice. You either don't need to call the police because the man left, or you call the police anyway to let them know what happened. I think that in this situation, you should still call the police and let them know what happened so that they can investigate and stop this man from going to other houses to try to trick other people. Okay, so now for our third scenario. Knock, knock. Do you either open the door or do you look through the peephole or the window first to see who is outside? We should never just open the door right away. We should always look through the peephole in the door or the window to see who is out there first. Once again, it's a man that you do not know. And once again, you talk to him through the closed door or window. He says he has the pizza you ordered, and this time you did order a pizza. You open the door to pay him and take your pizza. Now you have two options. Either you thank him, you shut the door and he leaves, or you invite him inside to share the pizza with you because he seems nice. The right answer is that you thank him, shut the door, and he leaves, and you enjoy the pizza all by yourself because he is still a stranger and you should never invite a stranger into your home. Knock, knock. I hope that by now you guys know which one we should do. Do you think we should open the door or do you think we should look through the peephole or the window first to see who is outside? Yes. Looking through the peephole or the window is always the first thing you should do. In this scenario, when you look outside, you see your ex-boyfriend. You do not open the door because you don't know why he is there and it is late at night. Through the window, you ask him to leave. He gets mad and says he is not leaving until you come outside and talk to him. So you have two options. Either you open the door to talk so he will leave, or you can call the police. 
You should never feel pressured to open the door when you are uncomfortable. So in this case, you should definitely call the police. Knock, knock. You know what to do. Yep, look through the peephole or the window. This time you see a police officer. So you have two options. You can either open the door or you can talk to him through the closed door or window. But even though he is a police officer, he is still a stranger, so you do not open the door. Instead, you talk to him through the closed door or window. He says he needs you to open the door. Do you open the door because you don't want to get in trouble? Or do you ask to see his badge to make sure he is a real police officer? Sometimes people pretend to be police officers. So in this case, you want to make sure to ask to see his badge. So he shows you his badge so you open the door or he shows you his badge and you call the police station to check his badge number. Someone who is pretending to be a police officer can usually get a uniform with a very realistic looking badge. So it's a good idea to call the police station and make sure that this is a real police officer. The police station confirms the badge number. So now you know this is a real police officer. You now know it is safe to open the door. Knock, knock. This time you don't have a peephole or a window to see who is at your door. So you either ask who it is through the closed door or you just open the door. But as we have learned, we never just open the door. So you ask who it is through the closed door. A woman says, your landlord sent me to spray for bugs. I need to come inside. But your landlord didn't call you ahead of time to let you know someone was coming. Do you open the door or do you call your landlord to confirm that they sent this person? The right answer is that you call your landlord to confirm that they sent this person. But your landlord does not answer your call. So do you tell the woman she will have to come back another time or do you open the door and let her in? As we have learned, we never let strangers inside. So you tell her she will have to come back another time. Notice that the door in the bottom right hand corner of our screen never opened. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how to answer our cell phones or our house phones safely. There's some information that we should never give over the phone, such as our credit card or debit card numbers, our social security number, our addresses, our work schedules, our bank account numbers, or that we are home alone. Now we are going to talk about how to answer our cell phones or our house phones safely. In this scenario, your phone rings and when you answer, someone says, this is your bank. We need you to confirm your bank account number so that we can deposit a large check. A large check sounds awesome. Who wouldn't want all that money? But we don't know who called us and we should never give out our bank account number over the phone. So we can assume that this person is being dishonest and we hang up. In this scenario, your phone rings, and when you answer, someone asks if they can speak to your mom or dad, but you live alone now. Since you should never tell someone that you are home alone, you can say that your parents are busy and ask if you can take a message and have your parents call the person back. That way, you can figure out who is calling and why without saying that you are home alone. In this last scenario, your phone rings and when you answer, someone says, congratulations, you have won a free cruise. We just need your social security number to confirm your identity. But because we know we should never give out our social security number over the phone, we know that this is a scam and someone is trying to trick us. So we hang up the phone. 
Now we are going to talk about calling 911. Only call 911 when there is an emergency such as a fire, a crime, a medical emergency, a car crash, or if you feel that you may be in danger. You should also call only when you are in a safe place and not in immediate danger. For example, if there is a fire in your house, you should never call from inside the house. You should only call when you have gotten out of the house and are safely away from the home. If you do have to call 911, they are going to ask you a series of questions, so be prepared with the following information. The location of your emergency. Sometimes we don't know the name of the street we are on, so if you start describing physical landmarks around you, maybe there is a Burger King or a church or you are next to a park, the police can usually figure out the general area that you are in. You will need to give them the phone number you are calling from or a good phone number they can call you back on. They will also need to know what type of emergency there is so that they know what type of emergency vehicles to send out, either a fire truck, an ambulance, or a police car. Sometimes they might send all three, depending on the emergency. So now we are going to go through a few scenarios to try and figure out if we should be calling 911. In this scenario, your grandma will not let you have macaroni and cheese for dinner and instead is making you eat meatloaf. Do you call 911? Absolutely not. There is no medical emergency, no crime, and no fire. In this scenario, your dad falls off of a ladder while he is cleaning the gutters and is struggling to breathe. Do you call 911? Yes, because in this case, there is a medical emergency. In this scenario, you cut yourself while shaving. Do you call 911? No, because this is not a medical emergency. This type of injury is something that you can take care of with a Band-Aid. In this scenario, you see smoke coming from the kitchen. Do you call 911? Yes because a fire is definitely an emergency. In this scenario, you run out of medication. Do you call 911? In this case, it depends. If you running out of medication could result in a medical emergency, then you should definitely call 911 or your staff or your parents so that they can get the necessary medication to you right away. However, running out of medication is not always cause for a medical emergency. If you're not sure what kind of medication you take, make sure you talk to your doctor or your staff or your parents. In this example, you come home and the back door is wide open and the glass is broken. Do you call 911? Yes. You call 911 because there has been a crime committed. In this case, the crime is a break-in. There are lots of different types of technology that can help keep you safe in your home. For example, you can get a doorbell with a camera so that you can see who is at your door, whether you are home or not. This is especially helpful if you do not have a peephole or a window near your front door. Remote support or monitoring is a service that uses technology to promote a person's independence and safety by having caregivers in a remote location. This could be in addition to staff or in place of staff in the home. For those who would like to be more independent at home, remote support or monitoring is a great option. As you can see in the photos below, Remote support and monitoring uses all types of sensors and technologies to help a person be safe and independent at home. For example, sensors can be placed on windows, 
seat cushions, floors, cabinets, the refrigerator, a stove, even the bed. These sensors can tell you when someone stands up, falls, breaks the window, opens the refrigerator. The sensor on the stove can even turn off the stove when the person walks away. Instead of having staff in the home, staff are available through either a computer screen or a tablet that the person can access at any time. In this way, help is only a click away while the person is living happily and independently on their own. It is so important that we have a voice and that our voices are heard when they need to be. Self-advocacy is about speaking up for ourselves and making sure that we are in the driver's seat of our own lives. We have the right to decide where we want to live and who we want to live with. We have the right to as much privacy and independence as possible. We have the right to live in a clean, safe, comfortable, accessible environment. We have the right to receive support in our homes, both personal and remote. We have the right to choose who we do and do not allow to come into our homes. We have the right to emergency services when we need help. We have a right to fresh, healthy, wholesome food. We have the right to feel and be safe within our homes. That concludes our presentation. I hope it was helpful. Again, my name is Bree Combs and I am the Community Connections Coordinator for the Butler County Board of Developmental Disabilities. You can email or call me anytime with questions or feedback about this presentation. My email is bscombs at butlerdd.org and my phone number is 513-785-2884.